Hi there. Take a look at this uh, humanoid right here. It walks from one checkpoint to another checkpoint and then to the next checkpoint and so on. And that is its task. It gets a reward from walking from checkpoint to checkpoint. Take a look at this uh, ant. This is called the ant. Um, it also walks from checkpoint to checkpoint. Now, we've seen a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms in this environment. It's called Muk Mukojo, um, where you basically teach these little things to walk around. So the what's the impressive part here? The impressive part is that at training time, this ant has never ever seen what a checkpoint is and has never gotten any reward from walking from checkpoint to another checkpoint. Actually, it has never gotten any reward for anything um, that that is given from the environment. It has discovered the skill of walking by itself. And then at test time, there is no additional learning when it goes from checkpoint to checkpoint. It simply composes the skills that it knows from its unsupervised uh, discovery phase in order to, to uh, go from checkpoint to checkpoint. So here you can see this paper basically proposes to learn these skills in a completely unsupervised way. At the beginning, sort of, so in the training phase, it learns these skills. You can see these skills that the humanoid has learned. And then all you have to do at test time is to compose these skills to reach a given goal. And these are the things that the ant has learned. Watch out, this is trippy. Um, you can see it has learned various walks, various ways of walking here. And if you know anything about this environment, it's actually not that easy to make the ant walk uh, by itself. So the, the discovery here that these skills that are discovered are various ways of walking is actually already pretty impressive. And the last thing here, this cheetah, of course, also has to has learned to walk back, forward, kind of jump around, and so on. So we're going to dive into this paper. It's called Dynamics Aware Unsupervised Discovery of Skills by Archie Sharma and other people of Google Brain. So this was published at iClear 2020. And on a high level, I already said, it's basically proposing to learn unsupervised uh, skills and then to compose these skills in a model-based planning method at test time to reach a given goal without additional training, without uh, additional training on the reward that you give at test time. As always, if you like videos like this, uh, you're very welcome to subscribe and share it to everyone you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay, let's dive in. So they say, conventionally, model-based reinforcement learning aims to learn a global model for the dynamics of the environment, which is not exactly true, right? So we, have, we dive into model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. Model-based reinforcement learning basically means that you have a model of the environment. A example for this is, let's say, uh, tic-tac-toe. So in tic-tac-toe, I know I, I, I have nine actions at my disposal. And if I take action, let's say I take action zero, which is to make a, let's say I'm the X player. So I take action zero. And if I, you know, number my things correctly, then that will result in this state of the world. Okay, so I know exactly how the world will look when I take a given action. And what that allows me to do is that allows me to actually plan. So I can now plan ahead. I can say what would happen if I took action zero. So I can do this in my mind. And then what would happen if I took action one, I can be like, okay, that's going to happen. And I can do this with many things. And I can, in my mind, continue this and basically roll out the entire games. Or, uh, and then only do the given action that has led to the best result at the end, right? So this is model, model based reinforcement learning means you have a model of the environment, you know, what's going to happen when you perform given actions. And 
you can also combine this with machine learning like uh, you know alpha alpha go alpha zero or so they have models of the games they're playing they know what's going to happen but it's very intractable to basically go down this entire tree and plan out everything so they combine it with machine learning um, it doesn't change that it's uh, model based now in a in opposition to that, in model free, in, in reinforcement learning, what you do, you are this agent, there's the environment, and you simply have to do an action. So I do action zero, and the environment just gives you back a reward and the next observation. And it, you have basically no clue how the environment will change if you do something. You, all these, all these, um, these agents do or the classic model free agents do is basically they're trying to have a neural network somewhere in them and you put the observation in here and out comes an action and you can do this in various ways you can do queue learning or policy gradient or actor critic and so on but ultimately it's simply mapping the op the current observation and maybe the last few to the best action to take without explicitly modeling what happens in the environment. Now, when they say model-based reinforcement learning, what they mean is technically what you can do if, if, you're in, if you are in the model free, if you're in this situation, what you could do is you could say, well, since these model-based RL techniques tend to work better, I could here inside the agent, I could try to learn a model of the environment. E prime and I could try to basically learn what happens in my environment when I do a certain action and then I could use that model right here in order to do this planning that I know from up here okay so in in this case um, they go for exactly this they go for let's learn a model of the environment this is not an exact model it's a learned model and then let's use that to plan now this usually has a bunch of you know very uh a bunch of things that go against it namely if this model right here is bad then the planning in the model will ex often accumulate and even exaggerate the errors that are in this model so it's sometimes very hard to learn a model of the world and then use that for planning and um, i've recently done a paper where where um curious ai takes denoising autoencoders to regularize exactly such a planning procedure to counter this and this paper right here is a, a different approach of combining this learned model um, this learned model so okay that was about the first sentence <laughs> they say it aims to learn a global model for the dynamics of the environment a good model can potentially enable planning algorithms to generate a large variety of behaviors and solve diverse tasks which is true right if I have a model of the environment then I could just use it to plan I wouldn't even have to do anything fancy anymore right if I have a model of how my tic-tac-toe works I can just plan um, plan my way to success and I can do this alpha zero style or if the if this uh, state tree is small enough I can actually just use a planner and um, I don't even have to I don't have to do anything anymore if I have a good model they say however learning an accurate model for complex dynamical systems is difficult and even then the model might not generalize well outside the distribution of states on which it was trained so this is another problem uh, if you learn a model it's only going to be valid in a certain range okay and say in this work we combine model-based learning with model free learning of and the model free learning is of primitives that make model based planning easy okay, so what they attempt to do is they attempt in an unsupervised fashion to learn so-called set of skills and the set of skills could be something like walk forward walk backward um stay put <laughs> uh jump so they attempt to learn things like this in a model-free way. Uh, so that the model is simply 
asked to come up with these things or the agent is simply asked tasked to come up with these things and then in um, in stage two a planner can use these skills and decompose a plan now this plan here the special thing about this plan this planner it doesn't operate in the space of actions of like small scale actions it actually operates in the space of these skills right here so here it would be walk forward walk back so and with if we have a good enough model of the environment it will tell us if i walk forward in this situation what will happen okay so i can walk forward and then after that i could walk backward what's going to happen right and if i have a good model of the environment um over the and the actions now are these macro actions of these skills uh, then i can use planning to reach my goal Okay, so the question is, how do we come up with useful skills that the planner can then use? So they need to be somewhat diverse, right? But also, and here is the, the crucial part and the, the sort of contribution of this paper. They say, how can we discover skills whose outcomes are easy to predict? And this is how they counteract this notion here, that if your environment model is crap, then uh, you're, you're, it can't, basically can't be used for planning. You'll just make it worse. So what they say is that these things right here, these skills that we learn, we will learn them in a way that make them easy to predict. So it, make, it makes it easy to predict what will happen after I do them. So they must be at the same time diverse. So only, you know, if you stay put, it's pretty easy to predict what's going to happen, like nothing, okay. But we're going to see in the exact objective that they have to be sort of diverse, but also, so only one of them can be stay put, <laughs> the other ones have to do something else, but also they should be easily predictable by the environment model. And if you learn the skills such that they're easily predictable, your environment model will make less errors, and then you can um, use it for planning. Okay, let's dive in. They do actually open source uh, code, and they have more of these videos if you want to check it out. I'll link everything in the description. Okay, let's actually dive into the, um, the meat right here. They say they do maximize uh, the mutual information. And we're going to see between, uh, between what and what. <laughs> they want to maximize the mutual information. If you don't know what the mutual information is, the mutual information is a quantity. Uh, the mutual information between x and y is a quantity. That's the entropy of x minus the entropy of x conditioned on y. Or you can also decompose it in the other way around. Entropy of y um, minus entropy of y conditioned on x. And we're going to, they apply this, where is it, equation two, right here. Okay, so what they want is the following. They want to maximize the mutual information. And the mutual information basically means how much does one variable tell me about the other variable, okay? Um, the mutual information between the skill, and we're going to see what that is, and the next state. So what, what is a skill? A skill is one entry in our table right here. So these here are skills, skills, and they're, in, they're indexed by Z. Now Z here, it seems like they're discrete, right? But in this case, they would be a con Z would be a continuous vector. But it's easier if you imagine that. Um, so each one of this is like Z one, Z two, and so on. Um, they're going to be continuous, but in our case, we'll just think of a discrete set of skills to be learned. Okay, so they say we want to maximize the mutual information between the skill that's currently um, in action. So in, in every, at every time the agent has to like choose a skill and saying like, okay, now I'm going to walk forward. And um, it's in a given state. And what you want to say is you have to maximize the mutual information between the skill and the next state, which means that it means two things. 
which you can see right here, you can decompose it in two different ways. One way is the following is to say, if I know which state I'm in, um, what's the entropy over my Okay, that's a wrong, bad way of formulating it. <laughs> it's if I knew, if I know these two things. So if I know the state I'm in and the next state that I'm going to, right? I can, in hindsight, I look back. If I know both things, what can I say about this skill Z right here that I couldn't say just from the starting state. So the starting state, let's say is the a person right here. And the end state is the person um, a little bit more over there. So let's, let's call this forward. It's the person is looking to the right. Okay. Now, if I only show you if I only show you the state on the left, the starting state, what can you tell me which action is going to follow right here? Basically, you can't tell me much, it could be any action like walk forward, walk back, stay put. But if I also show you the next state, then you can pretty confidently say, Ah, I know what you did, you did walk forward. Okay, so this, this in this situation, we would have a high mutual information between uh, Z and S prime in the formulation here. If you decompose it in the other way, it, this is equivalent, but it's a different way of thinking about it. It means when I show you these two things, how much more can you tell me about the next state than if I only show you this. So in this formulation, what we would do is we would say I tell you the human is here looking to the right. What can you tell me about the next state? And you like, well, I, I couldn't tell you very much, right? It can it could be anything. But if I then tell you the action is walk forward, then you could say, ah, now I now I get it, it's probably going to be something like this. Okay. This also would be a high mutual information. So you see that uh, the the task of maximizing this mutual information is good because what happens if I don't if I have a low mutual information, if I have a low mutual information, it would mean that I could predict the next state just as well from the current state. Um, it doesn't make a difference whether you give me the the skill or not. It, it would not make a difference. And that is only the case if my skills are basically either all the same or all pretty, pretty random and pretty useless, right? So if, if all my skills are basically walking uh, backwards, then I don't, you don't have to tell me which skill you do, I, I'm gonna know that the next state is like this. So you can see that the objective of maximizing the mutual information between the skill and the next state is going to result in a situation where these skills are going to be first of all, diverse, and second of all, easy to easy to predict. Okay. And um, it, to see this, yeah, we only have to imagine what would happen, wh what would happen in a in a situation where the skills weren't diverse or weren't easy to predict, and you'll get exactly the situation where the information of the skill doesn't help you in predicting the next state because yeah, either it's obvious or it's random. Okay, so we agree that it makes sense to maximize the mutual information. And they decompose this into two objectives. So they say the mutual information whoops, they, is basically um, what you'll have to do is you'll have to it decomposes into two terms. Um, where you can into two terms in a lower bound in the mutual information. And this is kind of the this is sort of the the standard variational approximation literature. If you're into that read up on variational autoencoders and things like this. Um, basically, the two steps here are you tighten the variational lower bound. And you maximize the approximate lower bound. Okay, so you have the mutual information, and you can lower bound it. Okay, you can, uh, 
you can lower bound it by this quantity. Now, the if since this is a lower bound, you can prove that this is a lower bound. It means that the higher you make this term, then the the more basically okay. If, if it's a lower, I don't know how to formulate, but it should be fairly obvious. If this if this thing on the right is a lower bound to the mutual information, then maximizing the thing on the right will maximize the thing on the left. And it will do so. Um, very, so imagine I is up here. And this E on the right side is down here, it's a lower bound, right? It's lower than I. So if I maximize E, well, I haven't really done anything to I, but if I maximize it even more up to here, and since it's a lower bound, I know now my I must be at least higher than this. Okay, so maximizing a lower bound to a quantity will ultimately increase the quantity. But you can also the efficiency by which it does this uh, depends on how tight the bound is. So if the bound is very tight, like this, you see, I is not much above E. Um, if the bound is very tight, then maximizing E will result in a faster maximization of I. Okay, so you can do two things, you can maximize the quantity that is the lower bound, or you can tighten the bound. And here you can see that the difference uh, that the tightness of the bound depends on this quantity right here, which is the k il divergence between this and this. So um, yeah, let's watch this in the context of we can actually go go through it um, on a high level. If you've never done this uh, variational approximation sort of math, then this might be a, a bit informative. Okay, so the thing right here is just pops out of the definition of the mutual um, information. It's the, it's basically the differences of the entropies, which the entropies are log quantities, right? So if you have a log a minus log b, that you can also write this as the log of the fraction of a over b. That's just a property of the log. And so it's expectations uh, over logs, these entropies. So you can write it as this thing right here. Okay. And this basically says, this is very high, if, um, or very low, depending, so you need to, uh, whether or something is low or high always will depend on what you exactly you have to consider. But ultimately, what you'll want is the ratio between this quantity, which is the probability of the next state given the current state and the skill you're taking divided by just the probability over the next state, uh, given the, the current state in expectation over all the skills, current states and next states. Now what they're saying is this here, this is basically the environment right? This is if you are in a state and you perform a skill, what's the next state? That's, that's the true environment. P here is the, the true environment, which we don't know, right? We, we don't know what the environment's going to do, but we would like to learn a, a model for the environment. And this model for the environment is now Q, um, Q theta, phi, theta, phi, Greek letter. <laughs> um, so Q phi here is going to be a neural network that will approximate the environment. And in this uh, probabilistic framework, it is going to be a learned distribution that will approximate the distribution of P. Right, so we approximate it by this. But now this is here, it says equal, equal, right? This is not equal, because this is just an approximation. So the equality must be comp must be basically compensated for by this term right here. You can see this here is expanded into these two. And you can go through the exact definitions and see why this is an equality. But basically, you can say that the mutual information is this expectation, or it is this expectation. But now you have to correct for the fact that here you only have an approximation. And you have to correct for the fact um, by exactly the amount by which the approximation 
is different than the quantity that you're approximating. And this is this KL divergence right here. So the KL divergence basically me measures how different two distributions are, right? It's, um, it's sort of a distance, not exactly a distance, but sort of a distance between these two distributions right here. It says, here's the real world, and here is your estimate of the real world. How much do they dif disagree? And that quantity um, plus, then you can replace your world, the exact world distribution by your approximate distribution. And you still are equal to the mutual information. And now the basically the trick is you say, oh, the KL divergence is always positive. It's a quantity that it can only be a positive number. So um, if I leave it away, certainly this is on, this is going to be a lower bound to the quantity. Okay. All right. So two tasks right here. First of all, tighten the variational bound, which means make this quantity small, make your approximate world model as close as possible to the real world, right? How do we do this? Neural network, okay? You input trajectories. Um, I was in this state, I performed this uh, skill, and I ended up in this state. Um, sorry, that's this, and then you simply match your neural network simply matches what happens in the real world. It learns the transition function, basically. So that's, that's the tightening of the variational bound. And the second step is this right here to mm -hmm. to maximize the approximate lower bound, right? The first step was tighten variational lower bound. That basically means make your world model more accurate. And the second is tighten that uh, maximize the approximate lower bound. Now this is going to part the, this is going to be the part that says, now given that I already have a, a better world model right here, can I improve my, can I sort of improve my uh, skills such that um, they become easier to predict and more diverse? Can I improve my skills such that this mutual information right here gets to be high, as high as possible? Okay. So this is sort of an alternating um, thing. And you can see this in this very, 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 very confusing diagram, honestly. <laughs> so what are you going to do in this algorithm? First of all, in each episode, you're going to select a skill at random. And as I said, these skills, they're not predefined. So no one tells the agent to walk forward. It simply says, okay, you have like, uh, in a discrete case, you would have like, uh, you have five skill slots, right? And um, the only thing I require is that they're sort of, you know, consistent over time. So skill one is always going to be sort of the same thing and skill two, but agent, you can basically decide what skill one is, right? But make the skill such that it's predictable and that the different skills are diverse. Okay, so you're going to sample one of the skills, like skill zero or whatnot. And then you're going to do two things. First of all, you're going to learn these um, skill dynamics, which is you're going to learn your approximate model of the world. Okay. Um, and how do you do that? Basically, here, you're the agent, and the agent will. So what what does the agent have to do? The agent will take in the skill Z. And it will take in the current state of the world and it will output an action. Now, this is the model free part, right? So the agent that somehow has to come up with saying, ah, skill zero, that's, that's, um, that's walking forward. And in this uh, situation, walking forward means I have to lift my leg or something like this. So you're going to take your skill, you're going to with your agent perform an action based on that skill and the current state of the world then the environment is going to give you the next state right here. And from those things, you can now learn your world model, you know, I was in state S, I, I performed action A, but I performed action A based on skill Z. And then I ended up in state S prime. And um, I can learn a model of the world, right? This is a triple, I can do supervised learning of a world model. Now here they do probabilistic learning, but, um, and we're going to see in a second how that works. But ultimately, 
they approximate the world with their model. Cool. So that's the this outer loop. And then what are they going to do next? They're going to use that world model to determine a reward for the agent. And the reward for the agent for taking the action. So the reward is going to be, oh, agent, you took action A. Now, what's your reward for doing this? This is the model free reinforcement learning part. Your reward is going to be very high if, if this was very predictable and um, if it is also diverse, right? So now the agent has to sort of max, sort of, the agent has to go and make this quantity very high, this we want the outcome of these actions to be predictable and dive and the actions themselves to be diverse. It is, I'm sorry, it's very hard to keep all of this very straight. Okay, but ultimately two steps, learn world model from the experience that you've generated. And second thing, learn the agent such that it maximizes this this quantity that we've seen before. And you do this via giving the agent a reward that is proportional to the mutual information. And we've already seen that we can approximate the mutual information by by this quantity here. Okay. So learn world model and make the agent go higher mutual information two steps. Okay, learn world model is very, very classic, you can say, okay, I need to improve, I need to minimize this KL divergence. Uh, so I need the gradient with respect to the parameters of my world model, um, I can write down the uh, KL divergence uh, like this. And then since I can do this reverse. So log a over b is log a minus log b. And since the world doesn't depend on the parameters of my model, this will simply give me this thing right here, which is the gradient of the log probability basically of my neural network. And this can be just optimized straightforward. This is a neural network, you optimize it with gradient descent. These are the inputs, this is the output. Now, okay, you this is all probability distributions, but ultimately you can you can do it pretty straightforward. Okay, so corresponds to maximizing the likelihood of the samples from P under Q. Now, the second step, maximize the approximate lower bound. Okay, so after they say after fitting Q after improving our world model, we can optimize pi, pi is the agent that actually takes the actions based on the skill. So it's given a skill, and it needs to perform an action. And it needs to maximize this quantity, as we've seen, it needs to maximize the mutual information between if I know the action, and if I don't, or the mutual information between the skill and the next state. I say note, this is a reinforcement learning style optimization with a reward function of this quantity. However, so you look at the quantity that they need right here, the quantity is going to be this thing. And this thing is just, I feed the skill and the state into my world model. And I look what what comes out of the world model. So this I can compute, right. But this thing right here, I can't compute because this is this is what happens in the world when I'm in state S and I just run my agent over in expectation over all the skills. So this I don't know. They have a log of this is intractable. And then so we approximate the reward function for pi as this thing right here. Now, first, let's look at what this thing is. So the reward of taking action A, and action A is based on skill Z, right? So skill Z was fed into the agent, the agent comes up with action A. So, oh, you, you want me to walk forward in this situation? Okay, I'm gonna lift my leg. That's the action. Okay, so the reward for this action, given this uh, skill, and given the current state is going to be 
what? It's going to be very high if this here is very high. So it's going to be very high if the probability, so this S prime is the state you ended up in, right? So after taking the action, you ended up in S prime. So if what, what does it mean when this quantity is very high? It means that my world model Q, that is approximating the world, thinks that this state is very probable if you were in this state and are given the skill Z. So this basically means that the neural network can predict with very high accuracy what's going to happen if you are in this state and are given this skill to perform. Right? This is one of the things that we want. Now what is it divided by? It's divided by this. And you can see here the ZI are other skills. So <laughs> It is, what does this mean? This is almost the same quantity. It means um, how well can the same neural network predict the next state if you were given a different skill. So it means if, if I'm here and I ended up here, how well can you predict it if I tell you that I walked forward? And here you ask, well, how well can you predict it if I, also, if I told you you walked backward, if I told you, you you jumped, if I told you, and so on. So you basically aggregate over all the other, over all the other um, skills you could perform. And each time you ask the neural network, well, how likely is it that you end up in the state that I ended up in? So what does it mean if this quantity is high, or sorry, if the entire sum here is high. That means that the, the skill doesn't really give you much information. The neural network is very good, no matter which skill you selected, right? It's, it's very accurate in predicting the next state. It doesn't really matter. The skill doesn't really matter. And this is what we don't want, right? We want that the, the, um, the skills are very diverse, right? So the top part is they're easy. It's easy to predict what will happen uh, if you perform a given skill and div we divide this by the bottom part and this makes it such that these skills are very diverse because if they're not diverse then it doesn't really matter which one you perform and um, then this quantity on the bottom will be very high but we divide by it so we want we want it to be low okay <laughs> now the reward is going to be the log of this fraction here and this makes sense, right, intuitively, but they're going to try to motivate this mathematically. And for motivating this mathematically, of course, they need to approximate this quantity right here. This quantity is the denominator, so they, this denominator is, a prox, is an approximation to this. It's an approximation. As you can see here, this is sort of, sort of, uh, a sample based approximation to the transition from s to s prime under the distribution of z but what you want is just uh, is the transition from s to s prime not in your approximation but in the real world and they formulate this they say okay we can decompose it as such as a um as an integral over this conditional right here. So they bring in the Z variable. And then they say, well, this, <laughs> this is approximately, approximately, we can replace this here by this, and we can replace this here by this. They say, well, since the, this is a, an approximation uh, the to, this is the world model is an approximation to the real world. We can sort of replace that, and then the, this is the this is the part that doesn't convince me. They say, well, this p z of s, we can just replace it by p z. Now this is it's very tricky to see what these quantities are. Ultimately, it ends up being that right here, but. It's, it's, it's so tricky. So they, they say we replace P Z given S by P of Z. 
And okay, let's think about this for a second. What does the top, the bottom quantity is simply the distribution over your skills. And depending on how you sample them, this could be like a uniform distribution over your skills. Like that's fine. But what's the top thing? The top thing, basically, we can use base formula to reformulate it. It's P of S given Z times P of, uh, all right, times P of Z divided by P of S. So this quantity depends on multiple things. Here's that prior again. And this means what's the general distribution of states? What's the general distribution of states if your agent acts in the world, right? This, um, and this we don't know. We don't, we don't know. Um, and also this right here, what's the distribution in the true world, what's the probability of a state given a given uh, given that you were acting under a skill Z? And this is also something we don't know because we don't know the world. We we don't have the world model. So you run into the same problem again and again that you're trying to approximate this. And they want to make this so mathematically rigorous, but ultimately and they go in the appendix, they go through various ways that they could solve this. But ultimately, they just say, well, this is approximately the same. <laughs> so this right here, it basically means what skills, if you're, if you're in a certain state, what skills uh, brought you here, basically? What, what skills brought you here? What's the distribution of skills that brought you to this state? And they say, well, we're just going to approximate that by the prior distribution over our skills, basically disregard the state here. And this seems overly shaky. Like, as I said, the, the entire paper makes sense, but I, I just feel it's trying to be overly mathematical. And then... <laughs> run into a point where you can't be and then they're just okay we'll we'll just replace it and and then sort of things break down like you can only be overly mathematical to some degree it, it doesn't really fit but okay so this is how you discover the skills you maximize these quantities alternately you learn the world model and you um improve your your skills by making them diverse and easily predictable so how do you then plan using these skills this is the second part of the paper and this is just as com complicated as the first part <laughs> so they say given the learned skills so the learned skills are policies over action given the um the z right so the, now you know how to like walk forward and walk back and so on and now you're you're placed in a world and you're given this checkpoint it says well walk there um and you want this to do this using planning you don't want to learn anymore you simply want to plan okay what do you do and as i said this is even more <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to do something like model predictive control but not over actions but over your uh learned skills so you have this planner in the MPC and the planner will in its head roll out a number of different um, a number of different plans it will kind of explore a bunch of different different plans Z it will roll them out it'll say okay if I do this and this and this and this what will happen using its world model that it has learned it will observe what's going to be the reward in each of these cases now, they say here, access the environment reward, but can also be estimated. And this is another sort of, I feel, weak point of this in that they now assume they have the true reward function, uh, but they don't have a world model, right? They don't have the world model, but they assume that they can sort of always ask for the true reward, which is probably not the case if you uh, if you... Like if you had a true world, but it could be the case. The reward could be something like, well, if you're over there, you get high reward, uh, but you don't exactly know how to get over there. 
in any case, so they roll out a bunch of trajectories in their head, they kind of plan forward, uh, see what's going to happen if they do this or that or this or that. And then they choose the best one of these forward thoughts and they execute it in the real world, right? So they say, well, I'm going to choose the skill walk forward. So the agent is now going to be tasked with walking forward and it's going to do that in the real world for a certain amount of steps, like 10 steps of walking forward. After 10 steps of walking forward, you go back, you say, ah, I'm in this new situation right here. What should I do? And again, the planner is going to be like, ah, if you first walk forward and then walk back, where are you going to be? And so on. So the planner will always plan basically to go from where you are to the checkpoint using a composition of the skills that you um, have learned. So the planner may be fine, okay, if I first walk forward, walk back a bit and so on, I'm gonna get to the goal. I'm going to reach the goal. Now please agent execute this first thing, walk forward. The agent executes it and maybe it won't, you know, it won't do as well, it will maybe end up here. And then it says, well, I'm here now, please, plan again. So it plans again. It's like, okay, I can still kind of walk back. I'll be here, here, but then I have to do something else. So now walk back and okay. So this is what's going to happen, but <laughs> it is going to happen in a weird way. Namely, what we keep are um, normal, since everything is continuous, we'll keep normal distributions of all our future steps. So we don't say, okay, I go here and then I go here. But what you'll say is I, I approximately go here. And after that, I'll approximately go here. And you'll do it in such a way that the peak of this normal distribution is going to be the highest where you think you will get the most reward if you follow this trajectory. Like if you follow this trajectory, you get a very high reward. And if I follow a trajectory that maybe goes here, I won't get a high reward if it actually turns out in your imagination that you do get a high reward for this trajectory, you'll change this distribution such that the peak is here. And of course, the tighter the peak is, the more sure you are. So you sort of are looking, if you look out into the world, you want the closest steps to be very peaky. And then um, as you look out, they can be more, more sort of broad. And that's how you plan ahead, you keep you keep doing a step so if you go from here to finally you choose, I want to go here where the tip is the highest, go here, then you imagine forward again, you refine these distributions over the future. And then you take the next step that gets you to the where the highest peak is right here, basically, and so on. This is simply planning in a continuous domain. It is pretty analogous to how you would plan in like um, AlphaGo if you or tic tac toe if you had a planner. But since everything's continuous, it makes it just so much um, harder. So they yeah, they always update these distributions, as you can see here, to the skill that gave you a high reward in your imagination compared to the rewards of the other plans that you had. Okay, well, this was a long, long way until we got here. <laughs> but if you recap, so first, they in an unsupervised fashion, learn these low level skills, such that they're easily predictable by their own world model, and diverse. And then in the second step, they can use that to, um, to do basically planning. So they first learn these skills, and then the planner composes them to make the agent do something. And again, the agent will never have to learn how to do this go from checkpoint to checkpoint because the planner can just compose these low level skills. So they have these experiments right here and we won't uh, go through the experiment because this video is already very, very long, but they basically show that um, they, their learned things, actually their learned skills do end up being very diverse, do end up um, predictable, uh, have a, a high variance and so on. They have to give certain priors to it to make it actually work in a real setting. But um, 
the results you can actually see in these videos and in the graphs. I invite you to check out the paper if you're still here. Uh, thanks for being here. I hope this, this work was one of the most uh, more complicated and mathy papers we looked at. But uh, I think I still think it's fun and um, I still think the outcome is pretty impressive right here, how you can use math to derive basically these intuitive, uh, very intuitive objectives to learn. Um, it's also pretty cool. All right, that was it from me and bye-bye. Uh,